Okay. Um, <clears throat> if we can actually kill the lights. I'm hoping that this will be dark enough that. Uh, I will paint the picture. I first have to let you know I'm, I've got an Italian name, but I was educated in America, as was my father and grandfather. <laughs> it was my great grandfather who came from Italy more than 100 years ago. And uh, I come from Detroit. And I was one of those Sputnik kids. I started kindergarten when Sputnik went overhead. And I finished high school the year that men landed on the moon. I was always going to be a space nerd. And people said, oh, do you want to be an astronaut? No, I wanted to be the guy who trained the astronauts. I wasn't going to go up there. That was too scary. I was afraid of heights. My idea of a vacation is a cabin in the woods where it's raining so I don't have to go outside and I can read a book. I am not an adventurous person. And it feels marvelously ironic to be talking to the Explorers Club because I joined the Jesuit order at age 40, thinking I would be teaching in a place like Loyola. And instead, what do they do? They signed me to the Vatican Observatory. So I had to move to Rome and eat that terrible food. And look at that horrible scenery. And what's more, they put me on the road. So I have been around the world three times. I have been to every continent, uh, never as a tourist, always working. I lived two years in Kenya. I uh, then went back in the year 2000 and uh, worked for a conference on meteorites. My field is meteorites. I actually got into meteorites because I went to MIT, mostly because my best friend was at MIT. And they had the world's biggest collection of science fiction, so I could read science fiction stories about other people having adventures. <laughs> and found out that doing science was an adventure by itself. The thing that made me realize that was a very charismatic professor, a fellow named John Lewis, who taught a class on meteorites. Meteorites are rocks that fall from the sky. I was giving a talk once in Northern Wisconsin to a group of Native Americans. And when I said, there are rocks that fall from the sky, one of the old women raised her hand and said, which sky? Which is a very clever question, because in that cosmology, like ancient European cosmologies, there were different skies for each of the planets. So she was asking what we all ask, where did the meteorites come from? And the trouble with meteorites is, first of all, they're hard to find. Secondly, they look an awful lot like rocks. If you brought me a rock right now and asked me, is it a meteorite? I would tell you no, probably without even looking at it. In all the years that people have brought me meteorites, only once was it really a meteorite. But that one time makes me hesitate. The trouble is, meteorites, once they land, they look like ordinary rocks. And so they're very hard to distinguish, especially in this part of the world where you've got all the rocks and the great glaciers. The other problem is that most meteorites are filled with tiny flecks of metallic iron, iron nickel. But as soon as water gets through the pore space, I can tell you how much pore space, that's what I do for a living, is measuring porosity. When I got to the Vatican Observatory, I discovered they had a thousand meteorites. And so suddenly I was the curator of one of the largest meteorite collections in the world. And that goes along with having to eat all that terrible food. Anyway, the water gets through the pore space, attacks the metal, the metal rusts. When it rusts, it expands. When it expands, the rock falls apart. So in a place like this part of the world, meteorites are lucky to last 10 years on the ground before they're indistinguishable from, from dust. They just disappear. Meteorites, however, fall equally everywhere on Earth. From judging from the flashes you see in the sky, you can estimate that probably 10,000 rocks big enough to survive passage through the atmosphere and hit the Earth, hit the Earth every year. You know that 10,000, we're lucky to get five. Not 5,000, five. Three quarters of them, of course, land in the ocean. Most of the rest of them land in a place where, you know, if a meteorite landed in the street there, you wouldn't notice it. It's really, really rare to be able to collect and find the meteorites, and there are people who make a living at it. And most meteorites are actually found in areas where there are no mountains or other rocks, like, like Kansas or the, the plains in, in India. 
about 1975, a woman at the, the Smithsonian, um, <clears throat> Ursula Martin, had the idea, having been in an Antarctic expedition, that the Antarctic would be an ideal place to find meteorites. And this slide is to remind me why. If you can't see it, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. Meteorites land everywhere. Meteorites turn black as they go through the Earth's atmosphere because the outer layers are molten away, carrying the heat away to keep the inside cool, but there will be a thin shell of black molten rock on the very outside. Meteorites are black, the ice is white. Makes it easy to find. Meteorites that land in Antarctica are frozen, so the water doesn't get into them, so they don't rust and they don't fall apart. The bad thing is that when a meteorite lands on Antarctica, eventually, most places, it will snow and the meteorites will be covered with snow, and so pretty soon you don't see them anymore. But the Antarctic sheet, it's about 10,000 feet at the South Pole, of course, at sea level, at the, at the edges, it slides downhill continually. More snow falls at the, at the South Pole, and more stuff slides downhill. So there is this conveyor belt carrying meteorites from the sky, from anywhere in the pole and the Antarctic ice sheet to the oceans. And they fall into the oceans and you don't see them anymore. Unless, as the ice is moving, it encounters a mountain range. And it doesn't have to be a mountain range you actually see on the surface. It's enough for the mountains to actually just block the ice. So that, you know, in the place where we were, it's about 6,000 feet the mountains underneath, maybe 4,000 feet, but it's enough to stop the ice from moving. In these areas, it can be very dry. Most of Antarctica, in fact, you would qualify as a desert. desert. I did my doctoral work at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I came there from Boston. The culture shock and the climate shock was pretty severe. 20 years later, I'm in Antarctica, and they're giving us the, the how to stay healthy in the Antarctic Plateau. And they say, Antarctica is a desert. It's very dry. The cold brings all the water out of the air. Here are the symptoms of dehydration. Your urine is very, very yellow. Oh, I remember that when I was in Tucson. You get terrible headaches. Oh, I remember that when I was in Tucson. You know, just you know, one after another after another. Go, I wonder if I was living in the desert, and of course, I never wore a hat. I never wore sunglasses because I was 22 and knew everything. And I think it's a desert, which occasionally gets dumps of snow. When the ice hits the mountain range and starts to pile up, the dry winds, which also flow downhill from the South Pole, they're called catabatic winds, start the ice to sublime. It's like saying evaporating when these liquids that evaporate, solids go, that go directly from solid to gas, it's called sublimation. What happens there is that you're left with the top layers evaporating, subliming away. The ice underneath that has been compressed by the weight of the other ice is compressed into a sheet of blue ice. And this blue ice may have a few bubbles in it, but otherwise it's pretty clear. It's pretty solid. And the rocks that were carried along don't sublime. So they pile up on the areas of blue ice. This is something that Ursula Marvin discovered in her first couple of expeditions back in the 1970s. And by the time I went, which was you know, 26, 27 years ago, 1996, they had been doing this for 25 years. Every year, NASA, and the National Science Foundation in the Smithsonian collaborated to send a team of people to the blue ice regions to collect meteorites. Because they're black, so they're easy to see, they're frozen so they don't fall apart, some of them could be a thousand years old or longer, and they're all gathered together by nature's conveyor belt. Um, you see that's in our what you can't see at the top there is New Zealand. The way that you get to McMurdo Base is you fly to New Zealand, 
and in particular to Christchurch, New Zealand, where the International Antarctic Center is. And from there, when you all gathered, and this was Christchurch in 1996, most of what I'm saying is still true of Christchurch, of course, looks completely different because of the earthquake they had a few years ago. And I go, I've been back there. In the Antarctic Center, you're, part, you're there because you're part of an approved scientific expedition. When the NSF decides that your expedition is going to get to go to Antarctica, everything you need is free. That's part of the deal. They don't want you simping on safety equipment because it's cheaper to give you better boots than it is to have to fly a helicopter and get out of it. There's a giant warehouse where you collect all the different kinds of gloves you think you might need, the, the coats, the white boots. The, um, <clears throat> the It's very important to have these, these black trousers that have um, suspenders here and here that are easy to pull down without having to take them off. Guess why? Because we were going to be living on the ice sheet for six weeks. All of this equipment was packed up in special duffel bags that they gave us. We were a team at six. And we were ready to go off to Antarctica. We flew there in a C-130 airplane which is what was in those days run by the National Air National Guard out of upstate New York. I believe it's now the Navy that flies them. But you know, there are C 130s that are equipped, equipped with skids so they can land on snow and ice. The airplanes were older than the people flying. And they were designed so that you would have a parachute between you and the seats. The seats had no cushions. There are no windows. You're, you're, you're basically designed for parachutes. There's no windows except a couple of windows, portals, where <clears throat> once the plane takes off, somebody from the, the pilot's deck can come back and peer through the window to find out if the engines are all running. <clears throat> this was us getting on our C-130. We went down there in November of 1996. November is summertime. But we're all dressed to the teeth in this heavy clothing because that's the only way we can carry it. And everything else is packed. We were told once we leave New Zealand and head over the ocean, there's no emergency place to land. If something goes wrong with the plane and the plane goes down, what you should do is find something in the cargo area that you can see behind you that was really heavy and strapped yourself to it so you could ground quickly. The toilet situation, I don't know if you've ever flown with a C-130. The toilet is a hole in the side of the airplane. <laughs> really useful for men, not so useful for women. And there's a little bucket that you need to, you know, to do number two and sit down. They did have staff lunches. So they had a little uh, sandwich that they wrapped up in a little of a can of water and a tub of chocolate pudding. But they forgot to pack the spoons. <laughs> that was, I think, the worst of it. Also, it was so loud and so noisy on the plane. You obviously you couldn't hear music. You couldn't hear yourself. You couldn't hear anything. The person here looking back at me was one of the six in our group, Sarah Russell, who became an old friend once we spent six weeks together. There were six of us on the team, and I may as well go down the list. The head of the team was a fellow named Ralph Harvey, who was a professor at Case Western. He was a student of the original guy who started the regular Antarctic Search for Meteorite program, Bill Cassidy. And when Bill Cassidy retired, uh, Ralph Harvey took over. Ralph Harvey has just retired this past year. Um, along with him was a safety officer, a fellow named John Scott. As far as I know, John must be well into the 70s. He's still going down there. John's life would be to spend Northern Hemisphere winters in Antarctica and Northern Hemisphere summers in Alaska. 
and he was just an expert in survival in the cold. And of course, he was a source of many stories. He went down every year to talk to me about the South and the people there. And one of my favorite stories, you can tell you get you're living together in a tent for six weeks, stories get to be a little scatological. Uh, he was describing trying out a new outfit, cold weather outfit, while climbing in Alaska. And it was like a bunny suit that zipped up entirely, and there were no other holes, there was no other way for cold to get in. And he was out there for eight hours climbing, and suddenly a call of nature occurred. And he realized the only way he could relieve himself was to take the entire suit off. But he really needed to, but it was cold. But he really needed to. And he had to do number two. <laughs> and it was wildly uncomfortable. So finally, he unzipped it, pulled it down, did his number two, zipped it up as fast as he could, pulled up the hood, and discovered where he had done oh. number two. <laughs> <laughs> Along with that and myself, so that's three, Rene Martinez was the fourth, and he was a fellow who worked at the Meteorite Receiving Lab at uh, the Johnson Space Center. The Johnson Space Center has a laboratory to collect extraterrestrial samples. That's where the moon rocks are, that's where the samples from the, the spacecraft that collected uh, interstellar uh, solar wind, which machine was that? I'm working on the name of it. The one from Comet Black Vint that collected uh, dust from the comet. All of that material, the, the material that's going to be coming from Rothbard Benning, all of those are the same processing, and they are also the lab that processes the meteorites. So he worked in that lab. He was going to go to go down and see how the, the meteorites were collected. And we had two women in the group, Sarah Russell. This was her second trip. In fact, she went down a third time. And uh, she was pretty much an expert at collecting meteorites. She's British. She's at the uh, British Natural History Museum. I'm sorry. Well, National History Museum, because if you're British, there's only one Natural History Museum. You don't have to put any of the label on it. And um, an expert in meteorites and an expert on dating um, gases and, and rare uh, isotopes within meteorites. And then the last one in the group was, I can only describe her as a legally sororitor. She was somebody who just enjoyed having a good time. We were wandering around McMurdo. These a big, giant, ugly Antarctic birds, schools would come by and they'd squawk at you. And she would look up and squawk right back. You know, and see what she's squawking. She just loved doing it. Um, she had been. Um, a student at Arizona State University, coming from the University of Arizona, I have nothing but scorn to Arizona State. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was your typical sorority girl going to a big state university. And walking down the hallway one day, she saw a poster. Some are interns at the Planetary Science Institute in Houston. And she goes, what did I do? Like chemistry? I did chemistry. That was real fun. So she talks to a professor. Uh, Susan Mykoff, who listens to her, calls up the people at LPI and says, I think we've got somebody for her. She wound up getting a degree in chemistry. And then, giggly, goofy sorority girl got into Caltech for a PhD program, which she did under the most severe and nasty and toughest planetary scientist at Caltech, a guy named Jerry Wasserford. And she had just published her thesis at the time she was here with us, and had won the Media Ridical Society's Year Prize for Outstanding Work by an Undergraduate. But she's a critical authority. <laughs> and kind of fun to have around me. So that was six of us. We piled on the airplane, and as soon as the airplane took off, the guys came out and looked at the engines, looked around, and the airplane did this beautiful turn and landed down. Because there was something not perfect and you're not going to fly all that way unless everything's perfect. So we sat in the airplane for an hour or two, sweltering all this heavy clothing in the summer heat of the museum until we finally flew off. Because there were no windows, everybody who was in the plane, not only our team, but the other teams going down at that time, were allowed to come up into the pilot's area and take pictures 
of the windows of the private to look through. So this was a picture of the ice bank as we're approaching Antarctica. And this is where we land in McMurdo. These are the airplanes, and this is where our, the, all the cargo was, was dumped out of the airplanes. There's no runway there. You land on the ice sheet. You land on the Ross ice sheet. At this point, they were only doing C-130s because the larger planes, they were afraid the ice sheet was going to be too thin, and they didn't know if it would hold it. That's where we landed. McMurdo is the you know, biggest base. And then um, we piled into this giant vehicle. You get an idea of how big it is by looking at these are people, and this is the tire. It's called Ivan the Terabus. Most of these pictures actually are mine. These I pulled off the internet because I didn't get any good pictures of this myself. And it would drive you from the ice sheet up to McMurdo. And this is McMurdo as it looked about uh, 1996. These buildings were Quonset huts where you would live. There was this kind of smell of mildew everywhere because you would go be outside in the cold. Summertime in Antarctica is like winter in the Upper Peninsula. It's about that temperature, it's about that feel. And you'd come in with snow on your boots and it would melt and it would get into the wool carpets and never go away. This building here was the science lab. It was a brand new science lab in 1996. And that's where again, scientists did the work who were actually doing research and staying in Antarctica year round. Um, they were called by the uh, non scientists, if you're a scientist, you were called a beaker. And there was a little sign that said Beaker Street in the style of Beaker Street from New York City. While we were there, we got training in how to drive a canoe, on how to tie ropes, on how to get out of your crevasse. And one of the things we had to do, it's hard to see in this picture, there was a giant warehouse of food. Once a year, a ship comes to McMurdo with a year's supply of food, and then it takes a year's supply of garbage back up north. When it's time for you to prepare to go on the ice, they give you giant cardboard boxes and a checklist that your, your leader has put together of what you want to put, because you're putting in not only enough food for six weeks, but maybe an extra week in case you're stuck there. You don't want to start. These are taped up in giant cardboard boxes, really stiff boxes. And they're going to be piled in the airplane behind you, the plane that's going to take you out on the ice. And so you ask, what kind of food did we have besides frozen food? I'm a chocolate holiday. Many of you probably like chocolate. Many of you are probably familiar with those Cadbury bars, the five ounce big, baby Cadbury bars. We brought a lot of those. I went through two a day and lost weight because <laughs> you were generating heat all the time. Before we actually went on the ice, we went out for an overnight test to, to make sure we knew how to drive the skidoos. All the boxes were piled on Manson sleds that would drive behind us. This is a scene from our test camp. There's actually four tents if you count them as one who the air before. Normally we would have three tents, two people per tent, but we had some stationary people along with us because it was our uh, first time out. We were in the shadow of uh, <clears throat> Mount Erebus. And I don't know if you know, remember, so at one time there was an airline that had a round the world flight that would fly over the South Pole. And the pilot and the co-pilot got into an argument about whether they were flying high enough. And the co-pilot said, we're too low. And the pilot said, I overrule you. The co-pilot was right. And that was uh, like a year or two before we were there. So Mount Erebus was still kind of, and it's a live volcano. You realize your only port out of Antarctica is a city built underneath a live volcano. This picture has the sun right there. It was taken at midnight. 
looking due south, of course, because you're looking across the South Pole, the land of the midnight sun. And I'm downwind because the catabatic winds, as I mentioned, flow downhill to uh, from the South Pole. What am I doing up at midnight taking pictures downwind of my tent? We don't have to go there. <laughs> Little yellow splotches on the ice afterwards. Um, I was told the ultra ultraviolet light destroys little yellow splotches very, very quickly. They don't do that anymore. They actually <clears throat> collect all of your remains and collect them out along with the other garbage. I try to keep them dirty and super clean. Once we were ready to go out, we flew from McMurdo and another one of those C-190s to an area you can see on the map that are dark. Those dark areas are patches of blue ice. And this area was called Meteorite City, and this area was called Elephant Marine. So we have got a hard to see in these pictures, but um, do you see that that kind of looks like the ear and the nose of an elephant? That's why that was called Elephant Marine. And it's a moraine because there's actually terrestrial rocks on the surface and a moraine. But down here, in this area, especially when there's a little jut out, that was where we had to go. We flew several, I think it was about two to 300 kilometers from McMurdo to a soft, snowy area where the C-130 could land. They kept the engines running. So we didn't go out that door we came in because that would be kind of dangerous. We, we went out the back. <clears throat> they unloaded everything that we had brought, packed onto the ice, including the sleds, including the snowmobiles, engines constantly running. And then the plane took off and went home. From there, we still had 60 kilometers to go. So we put the bed, we, we actually put up tents overnight to, to give it a good night's sleep the next morning. We packed all of the bags onto these sleds and dragged the sleds, three sled behind each skidoo for 60 kilometers with John Scott being able to say, this is the way we go, now we go that way. Of course, it all looks alike to us, especially those of us who have never been there before. But we found the way. The one trouble with these sleds is that they kept tipping over. And as soon as he tipped over, you had to stop, and you had to get two other people, and you had to push them up, and you were hoping the people in front of you noticed that you had stopped. Uh, usually they did. We all got there safely. Well, the first night we set up camp in New York City. We're just doing a, a walker run. We were in an area that had been looked at very quickly 10 years earlier. So there had been a camp there before. They knew this was a good place to camp. But they also knew there were lots of smaller meteorites waiting for us to collect. And as we're wandering around, Laurie, the, the silly sorority girl, walks around and sees a little piece of white that's not ice. How could you tell that she could? And we picked it up and wrapped the extra. This is hard. There's only one kind of meteorite that's white. And it's an instatite achondrite. They're quite rare. And he was really excited. So first meteorite collection was a particularly rare type, put it in a plastic bag, and you know, I'll tell you a little bit how they collected them. Very exciting, we're already collecting meteorites. That was uh, the plane as, we, as it landed. That, those are the sleds. The yellow thing on top of the tents that we were taking with us. And that's one of us on a skidoo. And this was the camp. Three tents, two people per tent. I was with Ralph, the leader, and John Scott, the safety guy, was with Renee, the other fellow, the two women in the third tent. And this is where we lived for six weeks. Obviously, there was some food. We kept the food outside. There's a little pole here. That was the weather station. That was my job. I was the weatherman. I kept track of the weather. I think we have another picture of the camp here. Yeah. You get a sense of the camp. We had solar cells to charge the batteries so that we'd have a, a live radio. That radio back to McMurdo. Every morning when you woke up, and morning was simply by the clock. 
because of course daytime and nighttime is light all the time. Every morning, uh, Ralph would get on the radio and we would uh, radio in, I think we were S20, the S2 was the group that had been around there the longest, S being science and then two in order. They were the ones who studied the penguins. And they were always a little odd, but everybody would radio in every morning. Yeah, we're all here, six souls, we're still alive. And you know, whether it's this, whether it's that, just to check in so that Myrtle knew we were there. <clears throat> the first thing that I would do every morning, sleeping in the tent, the tent was <clears throat> um, somewhat insulated, but not very strongly. There were four layers of, of uh, plastic padding, and then a really, really good sleeping bag. And everything that you wanted to keep unfrozen, you put in the sleeping bag with you. That included your tape player and your tapes, which was, of course, before CDs. Um, for me, my contact lens solution, my contact lenses. I didn't want to wear glasses because we were going to wear masks over them and the glasses fogged up in the air. Anything you didn't want to have frozen, you kept in the, in the sleeping bag. The first thing you did was to roll over and light the gas stove next to you. You didn't have it running during the night. So it was cold in the tent when you woke up. You'd heat up things. And meanwhile, you'd pull on whatever clothes you weren't already wearing, especially that you slept in your clothes. Put on your boots. Go outside to the skidoo. The skidoo is sitting on the south side of the tent. Of the tent. You'd rock it back and forth in case the treads had gotten frozen to the ground. Start it up, grab the shovel, go downwind, and find a row of sastrugi, which is what they call those little layers of snow. And you would park the skidoo sideways, blocking the wind. And you would dig a hole on the downwind side, the side protected from the wind, and you hope you remembered the toilet. As I say, they don't do that anymore. They actually have toilets so that we stuff there. This was 25 years ago. There was one time when somebody who had been stuck in McMurdo for you know six months said, Can I come out just for a week to get the heck out of McMurdo? He said, Sure, sure, bring your own tent. And he was a, you know, a skidoo re repair man, so we he you know, we would fix up the skidoos. Mostly he wanted an excuse to get out. And after he left, every morning we'd look up and say, oh, there's a meteorite. And now he forgot to dig a hole. After that, you have, you know, your breakfast, get in, you know, Ralph would call us all together. We'd describe where we were going that day, get on our skidoos, and go all quickly for meteorites. That was my tent. That was the weather station. That's where we kept the frozen food. And that was the, uh, the shortwave radio on time. That was a ice chipper in the bucket. You would go upwind to chip the ice out of the surface, put it in the bucket, and bring it back to the tent because that was your drinking water. Now, I mentioned I'm not a really adventurous kind of guy. Um, one of the reasons I hate camping is because I hate it when it's really damp and, and miserable. Not a problem in that argument. I hate having to carry all that water with you. Not a problem in that area. I sure don't like to have insects and mosquitoes on me. Not a problem in that area. I actually really enjoy camping in that area. One week, we decided to switch around. I wound up staying with Renee, and uh, John wound up staying with, with Ralph, just, to, just for variety. In the other tent, they didn't have a bucket. They had a plastic bag. To collect their ice. What's the difference? When we had the bucket, I get the ice in, I put the bucket in my lap, I take a big knife and chop, 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 chop until the pieces were small enough to fit into the, the pot over the stove. I'm in Renee's tent. I put the plastic bag on my lap and I'm about to go chop. In the first chop, I'm going, this is a really bad idea. Because it's going to go right through the plastic bag and probably get me. So at the last minute, they moved it away from me, and instead of hitting me, the knife punctured the inflatable mattress that I was sitting on. So now we have a little different problem there. The skidoos, by the way, I don't know if you're going to be able to see in some of the pictures, 
every one of them had a little picture of Homer Simpson on them. It was kind of the patron sin of people in Antarctica. Because you're at 6,000 feet, the air is thin, you're cold, you're overstressed, your brain starts doing goofy things, you're trying to do work outdoors, and you're dressed like the Michelin man, way too many clothes. And the most common thing you hear people saying, go, because you did something stupid yet again. This is me. You can tell it's not my name now. But you can see there's a, there's a mask, which is, I think, actually a, a motocross mask that we just put a foot on, so that you could drive and the wind didn't hit your face. And that was me indoors with my tape player. In hair that had not been washed in six weeks. Because, oh yeah, there was no way you could wash yourself, maybe except as a sponge bath. And you did that once during the six weeks. This was the weather. And I kept track of the, the temperatures. And they ranged, the actual temperatures ranged from about minus 20 to plus 20. The warm days were the bad days. That was when it was snowing. But the scale actually goes down to about minus 75, minus 80, and that was the wind chill pack. We had some days when it was not only cold, but very windy. A couple of days when it was too, much, too dangerous actually to go out with a wind chill factor of minus 80. This is the summertime. One of those days happened to be the day when a representative from the NSF and a couple of other VIPs showed up to tour the camp. And so we went outside pretending, oh yeah, we do this all the time. We're dying. And the head of the NSF group showed his intelligence by saying, I'm not going out in this kind of weather, you crazy. So he stayed inside and, and chatted with people inside. But the, the, the circle up here shows the wind direction. And it's always in the sun. The wind is always in the sun. As I mentioned, we had some warm days. You can't see anything in the picture, can you? If you looked at the original picture, you wouldn't be able to see anything either. Maybe I should actually just have this thing turned around and you can see my originals. <coughs> but there's not much to see there in the first place. Why don't I just do this? Why didn't I do that up to now? It snowed. And after it snowed, the winds came along and blew the snow off the ground, which is a good thing because we would not have been able to see meteorites. But it took 12 days of constant blowing snow. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is what a whiteout looks like. But actually, no, this is not a whiteout. This was just blowing snow. Whiteouts came later. While we were stuck in the tents, um, my friend, uh, <clears throat> my friend Sarah managed to read War and Peace. I read the big, thick biography, Eleanor and Franklin. We got a lot of reading done. And a lot of uh, chocolate Because there's not much else you could do. That's 12 days of my life. <laughs> and again, <laughs> And afterwards, the skidoos were basically you know, several feet deep in snow. But we managed to dig them up. That little tower there is was a GPS antenna because every time we found a meteorite, we'd mark its position with GPS. And this is how we went searching for our Easter eggs. We'd line up the six skidoos in a sort of an open circle. The, the ones in the, at the ends were a little bit in advance of the ones in the, in the, in the middle. We'd go on a line at a steady pace across the ice and then turn around and go back and just do a search across the ice until somebody saw a meteorite. And the rule was you don't go out of your lane. You don't have a competition about who gets to see the most meteorites. A meteorite discovered by anyone is a meteorite discovered by everyone. So as soon as you saw a meteorite, you'd raise your hand and stop the skidoo and hope the people you know, at the front we're paying attention. And then you would all converge on the meteorite. You'd be converging on the meteorite. And uh, everybody had a different task. 
Ralph would be the one who actually collected the meteorite. And this was the meteorite collection kit. You had a little scale with the number. We never bothered using the numbers. We took the photograph just to show the size of the meteorite. Every meteorite was you know, was <clears throat> documented with a photograph. And this is before the days of digital. So these are actually photograph photographs. The kit had a pair of scissors and bags made of Teflon and tape made of Teflon in little metallic numbers. You would pick up the meteorite with the scissors. It was more, it was better, more, more secure than trying to pick it up with forceps. Hold it up, Ralph would look at it and describe what kind of meteorite he thought it might be. Basically ordinary chondrite, instatichondrite, something interesting, something different. John would write it down in the logbook along with the number on the tag. The meteorite would go into the Teflon bag, you'd fold it over once. The number would go into the Teflon bag, you fold it over again and you tape it shut and it goes into the collection backpack. And then John would place a, uh, uh, a flag where the meteorite was because you would take the, the GPS measurement, but GPSs in those days are pretty uh, primitive and half the time the measurement wouldn't come through and you'd have to go back and do it again. One day we actually went from our area up to Elephant Moraine, just for the fun of it, just to see if we could find anything there. I want you to see in that picture. You can see the ice looks like you're on water, except it's frozen. Ralph actually brought a pair of ice skates and he said it's the only time he's ever ice skated uphill. You can see a bunch of us, you can see some dark rocks in the background because it is a moraine. And this was the tricky time when you actually had to look at each rock individually to determine was it a, a terrestrial rock which all looked alike or was it a meteorite which looks you know significantly different if you're the kind of astronomer who was using used to meteorites like all of us were and you could recognize a meteorite from a terrestrial rock unless you're 44 years old and you needed bifocals but you only had contact lenses i could not tell what the heck i was looking at if it was close up so every time I would find something, I'd have to call somebody else over. What is this? Is it a meteorite? Is it not? It's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. I was the old man, except for John Scott, who's you know, still going. This. I'm labeling this section on this day. There was one time when we've been there for about four weeks and we're driving each other crazy. You think the isolation of being in Antarctica would make you lonely, but the fact is you're never alone. It's dangerous to be alone. You're always in the presence of somebody else, especially in your tent. And we'd get on each other's nerves. And Ralph was an expert of, you know, how to drive me crazy. Ralph had this collection of best science fiction stories of 1995. You remember science fiction is what got me to MIT in the first place? And rather than letting me read the book, he would tell me the plot twist of each story. <laughs> Finally, he realized we were driving each other nuts, and he said to me, get out of the tent. Just go. Put on your earphones, play some music. And so the music I played was actually the same album. The uh, Samuel Barber <clears throat> Adagio that was set, that has the, the words of the Agnes Day set to it. And I could play it, but I won't. <laughs> but while walking with this music in my ear, I myself, though never out of sight of the camp, I felt for the first time like I was walking on another planet. And it was intensely Pleasurable, peaceful, spiritual, delightful. And at the end of the walk around, I came across 
a media event, close to our camp that nobody had done this before. One of the best things ever. So I just have a few pictures here to give you a sense. This, again, looks like it's totally white. This was a white eye. What happens when it's cloudy is that the light is coming from every direction, not just from the sun, which means there are no shadows. The sky is white. The ground is white. Everything on the ground is white. If there are no shadows, you can't even see where you're walking. And that's what an Antarctic whiteout is when everything is light. It's dangerous to be out there because you have no idea if you're about to walk into a, <clears throat> a crevasse or trip over uh, a row of snow. That was our camp seen from a distance with people on ski -dubes. Yeah, meteorites. We actually did find meteorites. This particular meteorite, which was uh, given, the numbers are given to the meteorites after their return to Houston. They're not the little numbers that we put in the tags. And there is a system, the first letters tell you where it was. And so ours was EET, <clears throat> Elephant uh, Marine, no, MET, Me Meteorite City. And then the number of the year, 96, and then the number in which they were looked at because on John's little list would be, you know, open me first. This was number four, and it turns out to have been a lunar rock. It's a piece of the moon, shipped off the moon by some impact, flown through space for about 10 million years, and then impacted into Antarctica. We have the majority of the, of the samples that we can study on the moon, and certainly any of the samples aside from the Apollo sites or the two lunar sites that the Russians brought back, are these meteorites. We're not sure exactly where they came from, except they're from the moon. But it gives us a better sense of what's on them. One of the first bags that they opened up, remember that uh, Institute contract, that piece of hard white rock? Lori discovered this, we're so proud of her. In the meteorite receiving room, as they opened it up, the scientist in question, I think it was Kathleen McBride, took a look at it and said, it's soft. She said, this is a piece of chocolate. <laughs> Somebody in the previous camp had dropped a piece of chocolate on the ice and it had turned white and it was frozen solid. So it was hard as a rock when we picked it up, but it was not a meteorite. <laughs> and what's worse, it meant that that particular section was now contaminated with organics from the chocolate and they had to clean up that whole so it was a disaster. So it happens. It happens. Uh, there was one final trip when John and uh, Sarah, it would be really hard to see them here, called in for a uh, an airplane to take them, just the two of them, off to another part of Antarctica where a place where nobody had been to before to see if it would be a good place to look for meteorites in the next season. And so they were gone for a couple of days. Also during that time, besides the uh, NSF VIPs, we had um, a journalist, a famous science writer, whose name I will not mention. Uh, uh, she wrote a book on packing for Mars. Mary Roach, Mary Roach. Mary Roach showed up and stayed with the two women for 48 hours. And they were laughing their tails off because she was afraid to go outside and do number two. So by the end of two days of not having a ball, this is the kind of thing to worry about with following. One of the things that drives me nuts of bad science fiction is, ah, we have these people in a spaceship for six months, and they're men and women, and they're going to fall in love. Uh-uh, does not happen. The stress of being that close to people kills any kind of romance. They won't even let Mary Cuffins go, because it kills 
that kind of relationship. The only bodily functions you worry about is did you eat and did you have a bowel movement? That's the kind of, yeah, you're down to the essentials. Just romance doesn't happen. Nobody asked me about being a Jesuit at the Vatican in Silverstone. Religion, you don't talk about. I had a little, uh, uh, you know, I'm a brother, I'm not a priest, I don't do mass, I can't, I can't do those sorts of things. But I had a little Tupperware of consecrated hosts that I would take at two in the morning when no one else is around. Because politics, you don't talk about. There's no way to get away from people. So you just say, we're not going to go. We're not going to talk about religion. We're not going to talk about sex. It's just, it's stressful enough being there as it is. My way of getting along with people when I'm in stress is to sort of pull into myself and not say anything and let it pass. That doesn't work for six weeks. <laughs> it might work for a day or two, but it will drive you nuts if you try to keep that up for six weeks. You've got to complain. You've got to tell your roommate that he's driving you nuts. How else is he going to know? We celebrated Thanksgiving and Christmas on the ice. And for Thanksgiving, we pulled out these frozen things that we thought were, uh, were you know, turkey pot pies, heated them up, passed them out, turned out they were sort of rianos, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we you know, distributed little joke gifts to each other for Christmas. And then it was the day after Christmas that we packed up and started to track back to the place where the airplanes would pick us up. Those are the cardboard boxes. Once we got to where we were going, we had to put them on the same car, uh, wooden skids that we had left the time before. The airplane showed up. It was a beginning to be a cloudy day. It was beginning to be a whiteout day. But the first plane was able to land. We were able to load up everything onto the plane. And then with a fully loaded plane, unlike before, we had to try to take off. The plane was too heavy to leave the ground. The friction of the skids on the ice was too great to let the plane get up to airspeed. We were about ready to stop and dump some stuff behind and you know, just leave it behind. Until the pilot, very clever, who had done this before, found a ridge where bouncing, bouncing, and bouncing, and finally bounced long enough that the plane could get an airspeed and keep going. Because it was the day after Christmas, and we wanted to get home. We wanted to at least have a shower. Six weeks without a flush toilet and a shower is kind of a long time. The next plane comes in, and the two guys left behind. And John's looking at this, and, you know, and, and as the weather was coming, and he says, first time religion came up, he goes, Guy, you're a Jesuit. Pray for clear weather. We don't want to be stuck here. Well, I got off the ground, but it really was a white up situation. And the plane is circling around, trying to figure out, was it going to be safe to land? Where could they land? As I say, you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see where the ground was. You couldn't even see the horizon, because everything was white. It was just clouded over. And they're on radio contact with John and he's basically talking to them. So they're saying, you know, it looks like the weather's going to get worse. Put up the tent. You may be stuck here for a week. We're afraid, but it's just too dangerous. There's no way to... <laughs> Never mind. We just found the ground. <laughs> they uh, broke a couple of bolts. They got in a little bit of trouble for being too close to the ground, but they did get to the ground. And John and Renee and the rest of the meteorites and the rest of the material got back to McMurdo. Uh, to we spent the next few days cleaning up everything that we had taken with us, unpacking the material that we didn't use. And it was New Year's Eve when we finally got on the C-130 to go back to uh, New Zealand. The C-130s travel at a speed of about 300 knots. Unless, of course, there's a 100 knot headwind. So what had been an eight hour flight coming down was a 12 hour flight going back. Again, no cushions in the seats, holes in the side of the airplane, not particularly great food. But we were really happy to get back to New Zealand. 
Here's my portal. And I end with my one little religious thing. While I was there, all I could remember was Psalm 138. Lord, you search me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shield, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea. Is what I just done. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. That's your Yeah. It's different between the Protestants and the Catholics. There was one number difference. <laughs> the uh, one little adventure. I had bought a watch just before going to New Zealand, thinking that it would be important to have a good watch. And since I wanted a watch that you know I could use afterwards. I got one of the watches that glowed with the numbers glow in the dark. And I remember once waking up in the middle of the night. All right, you left my watch on to keep it warm. What time is it? You know, how many more hours do I have if I roll over? I put the watch up to my eye. Of course, I didn't have my glasses on, so I needed to have it close. And I couldn't see the numbers. And I was so irritated. Brand new watch. Why isn't it glowing in the... Wait a minute. There is no dark. Wait a minute, I'm wearing a mask. No wonder I can't see the watch. <laughs> it was very odd seeing the sun moving in the opposite direction, seeing the moon moving. Because not only do you have a midnight sun, but you're also in the Southern Hemisphere. And your orientation of what way is north and what way is south gets very confused. Which once again made it feel like I was in a different planet, in a different part of the universe. The air was phenomenally clear. The closest I've ever experienced is maybe in the Kiwanau Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula. But even there, the Antarctic air, there's no vegetation. There's no diesel fumes. There's no cars. There's no people. Your sense of taste becomes extra acute because you're otherwise so deprived of sensory input. A number of the photographs that I've shown you, if you've been able to see them, you would see where, look at they're terribly underexposed. I used the light meter and then opened it two stops more because the light meter kept saying, oh, it's too bright, it's too bright. But even two stops open, it was still too dark. And there's the light meter. Taking photographs, of course, film camera. I had had my camera, I sent it off to a, a, a camera store here in Chicago to have all the grease taken out and replaced with whale oil so it wouldn't freeze. I had rolls of 36 exposures that wouldn't go past exposure 28 or 29 because in the cold, the film was too stiff and it would stop. And a lot of the pictures were scratched inside the camera. It was an adventure of a lifetime. And even though it's 26 years ago, I'm going to forget it. And I'm delighted you came here to hear some of my stories. Thanks a whole lot. Well, let me tell you whatever happened, too. Um, Ralph Harvey, as I say, a wonderful full professor and is now retired from K uh, Case Western. John Scott is still leading expeditions in his 70s. Uh, Rene Martino still works at NASA. You know me, I'm now the director of the Vatican Observatory for since. Sarah Russell is um, a, still working at the Natural History Museum as a researcher, but she's also married and a mom, and her older daughter, who's now 15, is my goddaughter. As you say, we became very close. 
And what are you The Goofy sorority girl? Well, no, there's a professor there who's in the state for a little while. And then was hired away to be an NSF headquarters for a little while. And then the Goddard Space Center for a little while. Until eventually she became the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Research. <laughs> but she doesn't have that job because she's now the head of JPL <laughs> and still a giggly sorority girl. Just happens to be an incredible genius. Thanks, everyone. Lots of questions. Any questions? Sure. What do you do with the meteorites once you collect them? The meteorites, um, it, this is why it's the Smithsonian and NASA and NSF. NSF pays for us to be in Antarctica. NASA pays for the processing of the samples at the Johnson Space Center. And the Smithsonian curates the meteorites. Most of them are held at JSC, at, 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 at the, the, the NASA, the Johnson Space Center. Uh, some of them are, the ones that are more likely to be accessed are actually at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They are available to anyone who has a research purpose. We couldn't keep any of them. They're all, uh, there's a committee that, oh, yeah, you have an idea for a meteorite. This is the experiment you want to do. You write to the committee. They look it over and they say, yes, we will give you this precious sample or not good enough to try again. But they're, they're available to anyone anywhere around the world. Other questions? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between an observatory that's sponsored by the Vatican and one that is no, has no religious affiliation? There are two differences. You know, I used to work for NASA. I used to work on NASA grants. I was 40 years old before I wound up at the Vatican Observatory. So I know I've been to both. There are two really important differences working at the Vatican. The first is I don't have to write grant proposals. I don't have to get permission from anybody to do the science. When I arrived, I was told, do good science, period. Basically, the Vatican Observatory is a sign to the world that the that church supports science. It's not against science. And we can only do that by actually doing science. But because I don't have to worry about getting my grant renewed every three years, I don't have to worry about tenure in six years, I can choose to do research projects that may take 10 or 15 or 20 years to come to fruition. The physical properties of meteorites, which is what I've been doing since 1996, is a project. The first time I presented it at a meeting, somebody said, why are you doing that? Nobody does that. You can't get paid for that. Well, that was exactly why I was doing it. Because I knew people knew, needed the data and nobody else was doing it. Because it was not the kind of research that NASA would fund. So we've got this freedom to choose our research, but it tends to be, for that reason, long-term research, which complements the work of our colleagues. And often what will happen is we'll have you know, colleagues in universities as co-authors. Once we establish a track record, then they can get the massive grants to get us better equipment and push it forward. The second difference is a personal difference in me. Why am I doing the science? What gets me up on a Thursday morning and makes me want to go down to the lab? It's not for fear that I'm going to lose my job. It's not, this is the only thing I know how to do for a living, so even when it bores the hell out of me, I've got to keep doing it. It's not to impress people that will show up those guys that are his own state. None of those are the motivations. It has to be for the sheer joy of learning new stuff in having new stuff to share with my friends and family. It changes the things you choose to do as a scientist. I mean, the biggest issue that they don't teach about in graduate school is how to choose and find a research project. One that's big enough that it's worth doing, but small enough that you're actually likely to be able to accomplish something. And it changes the equation about how big or how small you need to be. Instead, the equation is more about what is it I've always really wanted to know? Rather than what's going to get me funded. That's the real thing. Good question. Yeah. Um, why they pick you for this team of six? 
coming from the Vatican? Was it political or um, not really? Were you did it rip the a, a bit of both. As I say, I've been in the field for twenty years. People already knew. It. Okay. Um, in particular, when you go to Antarctica, you don't have to pay a thing, but they also don't pay you. So you have to be working at an institution that's willing to give you up for two months and continue paying your salary, even though you're not you know, teaching a class or doing the research that they expect. And so that limits the number of people who are available to go. Um, I first heard about this program and was invited to apply at a meteoritical society meeting. I remember it was in Prague. It was at a restaurant, which in English was translated as the beast meat restaurant. They basically gave. And I was sitting next to Ralph Hart, and he goes, Joshua, that's cool. That would be fun to have. If you're thinking of applying, I'll give you a hint as to what they were looking for, at least when I was there. It was you know, a certain knowledge of the field, a certain basic competence, certain good health. But really, what they were looking for was a sense of humor. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. Because Lord knows you're going to have endless opportunities to laugh at yourself. Yes. Um, I've got a question. As you were mentioning uh, during your presentation that there were moon rocks mm -hmm. that you found um, exactly, you know, throughout not just your search, but throughout earlier, I guess, in our, in our uh, you know, like in the 60s right. or 50s, how long or how many moon rocks have we found? Yeah. Um, most uh, the first meteorite that we realized was a rock from the moon was only recognized after the Apollo program when we had the moon rocks in hand to be able to identify these are the chemical traits of a moon rock. They have the correct oxygen 16 isotope levels. They have the correct uh, oxi you know, oxidation state and you know, the correct mineralogy. And those are really distinctive and different from meteorites, other meteorites. And the first one was actually found um, in the mid 70s in, a, in Australia. At the time I was there, there were 12 meteorites in the moon that were known. The number now is probably more than 100. A lot of them, probably half of them from Antarctica, the other half now are from the dry deserts of the Sahara. And that's another place where if it's a rock and there are no mountains around, it stands out. And while you don't have the sand you know, collecting it, you do have a lot of people who live in the area who've discovered, hey, people will pay real money for these rocks. And so the you know, the, the, the dry deserts of Northwest West have been also very much associated with rocks. Likewise, about 100 Mars rocks. And the Mars rocks were hard to identify at first but we're pretty confident from Mars. Starting with one that was found in Antarctica that had little bubbles that when you looked at the gas in the bubbles, the gas exactly matched the atmosphere of Mars as measured by the landers. That was the filler evidence, but not the only evidence. Because I remember reading that even Bob Braun, and that was during the mid-60s, yeah. that he actually went that hard about to, to look for Yeah, and um, they didn't quite know how to search for them. The Japanese had also had a couple of early expeditions down there, but it was the late 70s before both the Japanese and the Americans had this systematic search. One of the things that Ursula Marvin discovered is that you needed skidoos. By foot, you couldn't cover enough territory. By helicopter, you weren't going slow enough to see the rocks. Skidoos were just the right speed. Yeah. It's not really a question, but more of a request that you say something about it. Um, the recent Herman Herzog film about oh, meteorites. Right. Uh, I just want to do a plug for it because I can't remember the name of it, but since you were in it, you might remember the name of it. Um, they do a really good kind of take on a South Korean team that is there that made me immediately want to sign up to do that. But <laughs> if you want to say something about right. that film. Um, Werner Herzog made a, a film, a documentary, which was on Apple TV. They basically paid for it. What the heck was the name of it? Chris, can you find it? Yeah, uh, Fireball. This is Fireball. Yeah. That was, yeah. And uh, so Werner Herzog is also in the, the, the what's that Star Wars spinoff? Oh, um, 
The Mandalorian. So you see, I'm, I'm, you know, one step away from uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. I guess. <laughs> um, he came for a couple of days and filmed us in our laboratory in Casta de Belco, and also in the lab of my good friend at Arizona State. We don't need uh, in Oshawa. And it's not a bad, all in all, it's not a bad uh, documentary. The filming of the collection of the meteorite was a little hokey, but uh, it was basically there were no outrageous mistakes in the film. It, uh, and the good thing about it is that he connects meteorites and our tradition of meteorites to not only our science, but also our human condition traditions, uh, the traditions of indigenous peoples, because meteorites fall all the time. And it's important to recognize that that blue sky or this day's gray sky overhead, you know, it's not an impenetrable barrier. We are touched by the rest of other things. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Is um, anybody like planning to do sign for the raffle who hasn't done it yet? Because you've got like very last short chance time. if you want to enter into the raffle. We've got some beer. We have an explorers book time class, and we have um, some gel ribbon here that was donated. But these fill out a sheet. Does the laptop have battery at all? Yeah. It's got battery. Yeah. Uh, let's let's put the photos on the loop if you don't mind. I can do that. Okay. I'll just let you set it up here that way you sure. Right. Let me do this. And actually, do you have a Yes, this is a free raffle. You don't have to do anything to enter the raffle. Just by attending, please. You need to be here to get your prize. You just have to be here, right? And. How do I do this so that it loops? Um, Thank you. Well, you have What's it coming? Right. I can probably figure it out. Um, <laughs> the other